<laughs> Good morning, everybody. So I'm very happy to be here today, this morning. And I thought as a first talk in the morning, maybe a little bit something more um, entertaining. And uh, on the other side, I was thinking, OK, next generation wireless edge networks, what will be the problems which we'll face? What are the challenges we need to address? And what a higher challenge, actually, than putting all of our nice laboratory equipment into the wild. We need to make sure that it works again and that not somebody has to sit next to it the whole time and maintain and support it and, uh, you know, like make sure that it feels nicely good, exactly as in our labs. So today it's about how to enable this and what is actually self-awareness and some case studies which uh, are going into that direction. The work is very early, I must warn you immediately. There are uh, some pre-works here, but it's definitely not finished. We, are, we have something to do for the next 10 to 15 years, probably. So, um, it stopped working, okay. So, what to expect actually today? So, first of all, um, I would like to give you some examples, which we have gathered over our uh, various projects with uh, IoT devices and IoT networks outside, outdoors, in the wild, typically. Then we will define, we will try to make a first definition of what is actually self-awareness and what is collective awareness. And I will present you two case studies. First of all, we will look into some complex sensor fault. We'll see what they are a little bit later. And the second one will be how to catch actually teeth of our IoT devices. This is a general problem which we face always. Um, come on. Okay. So what kind of examples do we... Uh, do we have? So, first of all, I would like to present you with a project which we started approximately one and a half years ago. It is a project supported by the German Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and it's all about protecting livestock animals from wolves. Probably many of you have heard news about wolves uh, catching sheep, catching uh, uh, other animals. Uh, it is a big problem, especially in north of Germany, where uh, it becomes really more and more pressing. And our idea was actually to um, build a fence around the uh, livestock animal, which is typically actually there anyhow, but it's too light to actually protect them from the wolf. It's only there to protect them from going away and from running away. And to put some cameras on the whole system and to recognize the wolf with those cameras so that they can be repelled. The repellent part are doing colleagues of us at the University of, uh, uh, of Gießen. They're the biologist and the behavior scientists. We are doing, of course, the uh, recognition of the wolves and actually the whole network and the installation and the deployment of those detection and repellent devices on real farms or outside on meadows and, uh, and forests. So what kind of problems we have? The camera which we installed typically looks like that. Uh, where, of course, we're not able to perform our experiments really in the forest with really, uh, let's say, wild living animals and wolves because they are not, they're pretty shy and they, we don't have the time to wait for them pretty much. So uh, what we do instead is that we're going into all of these uh, animal parks who have actually wolves and we are trying to uh, teach or to train our models with those wolves which are there already. And so the camera which is there, you see it here, this is how it looks like. It pretends to be w watching out of the fence and pretends that the livestock is behind it. Of course, it's exactly the other way around. The wolves are actually behind the fence and we are in front of them. But that doesn't mean anything that doesn't um, impact the training model at all. And we, have, uh, we can consider various problems if we try to transfer now this network into reality for real farms and for real protection of livestock. First of all, there are pedestrians around who are at least curious what's going on here. What are these cameras? Who is filming me? For what are they there? And it, is, it has happened already that people try to destroy them or try to turn them around, either down or up, so that, they, so that the camera at the end doesn't do whatever it's supposed to do. 
Of course, the livestock itself is a problem. It can nicely rub on the camera, um, you know, like every possible thing. So also other things which are possible with livestock, which they do. I can imagine that you can imagine what them also. Wild animals is another problem that they can also destroy partially your devices. Um, storms are also unpreventable. There is no way. Rain, snow, everything goes onto your poor devices. And on the other side, the farmers who would buy them one day don't want, of course, to be directly there and constantly washing them away from rain and snow. This is not the idea. If they're around, they actually don't need it anymore, <laughs> right? They can protect their animals by themselves. So the idea is really that we need to make sure that those devices are able to survive in the wild at least for days or weeks without any maintenance. And of course, age is a big problem, and it happens much faster in the wild than in the lab. But I think everybody who has worked already with IoT devices, even on the, in the lab, or for teaching, for example, knows how fast they actually degrade and how fast you can throw them away. So, this, let me give you some examples, some clear, concrete examples. So this is, these are two examples of nice pictures. Okay, we see the wolf there, I hope you can see it. There is one guy, there is another one. They're clearly to be seen, there is absolutely no problem with the camera. This one is a night vision camera, the other one is actually during the day. And the wolf is pretending even to pose in front of the camera a little bit, you know, like it's, it's, it's an amazing picture actually. So this is what we want. Right? And if we, for example, call for help other people to say, hey, we need more wolf images, they deliver us such things. Even something where the wolf is just still, you know, like a portrait photo of a wolf. And we say, yeah, but that doesn't work, unfortunately. And uh, so what we actually get in reality resembles much more that. This is rain. Okay, this is expectable and it's a very nasty problem because the wolf doesn't care whether it's raining or not. Uh, it's still coming and getting your sheep. So this is a big problem and you see how it looks like really each of these raindrops. It's just, uh, it's just a big problem for us. This is a very nasty problem. Do you see this light sun here? This is not the sun. What happened is that we installed our camera during daytime in one of the wolf parks and everything worked nicely. We come in the morning back and we figure out all the night photos are looking like that. What happened? This is their own camera for surveillance of the wolves which for some reason we managed to align them perfectly to each other so that they're, wo they're watching each other instead of watching the wolves and both of them during that night stopped working at the end. So all of these things like this, I would say, oops, sorry. I'm a little bit confused with this thing. Um, this thing at least is something expectable. Okay, everybody knows that we will have rain. That's okay, it's north of Germany, N rain is coming. However, this is something which you, you don't think about. You have no clue that it's there. Nobody told you, you don't even, you cannot guess that there will be such a problem, and it still can happen. So, another example is, um, okay, again, this is okay, not the wolves, admittedly, uh, it's a normal house, but it is again a picture as we would expect it to be, right? Then this one is again what happens when it's rainy, so it can be even worse than what we had before. And can somebody guess what is that? Fog? No. Come on, what this could be? Huh? No? 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 It's a spider. <laughs> it is a spider, you see? There it is. That's a spider. And uh, this is another problem, which we were like, oh, we forgot about all of these spiders and insects. Especially the spiders are nasty because they not only walk across your camera image, which is kind of okay, but they actually build their nets over it. And so what should you do there? If somebody has to go and clean them up pretty much, or you need some sort of a, 
um, car, 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 car cleaner. Okay, let us get a little bit into more, let's say, uh, problematic cases and harder cases. Like what I presented until now was really from outdoor and things which we didn't expect. We, we, we didn't count too much on that. Some of them were expectable, some are not. But also looking into our IT devices themselves, we again bump into many problems. One of it is actually degradation, the aging of materials. What you see here um, is humidity, which is like the blue line, is actually the correct humidity. This is the ground truth. And then the red one is a sensor which is already a little bit oldish. So it is following approximately the ground truth so that it becomes really hard to understand who is now wrong and who is right. On the other side, we know, because the ground truth is a really good sensor, that it is not correct. And this difference here might make a big difference in the wild. For example, in agricultural applications, that could be a problem, even if the difference between those is just a few percent here. It may make the difference between constantly irrigating your field and uh, putting everything underwater, or not irrigating enough and not getting your agricultural yield as you would like it to be. So we are trying already uh, to put some sort of a taxonomy. This is something which is, will be definitely developing. And if you ask me again in a couple of years, I'm sure that it will be much bigger. But right now we are trying, uh, we kind of identify that there are three different types of problems which we can get in the wild when we put our IoT devices somewhere where they're accessible to the general public. One is purely environmental and natural, let's say, which means weather, material aging, animals, but also humans non-intentional. So somebody falling against the camera, somebody, you know, like it's not intentional, children playing. It's not for bad, just for not knowing better or for doing it completely without knowing it actually. Then there is some uh, sort of threats, let's say, which are physical and they're intentional. Power cut is the most dramatic one. Somebody comes and cuts your cable. It's pretty much over, but the, it is actually a problem which we're trying to address. Theft is a big problem. Somebody grabs it and says, ha, oh, let me see at home what it is. Then, of course, you can have hardware attacks of any possible ways you know, like imagine it yourself pretty much, but also tempering of devices. Like you're not trying really to, to, to destroy them, but you turn, for example, the camera up or down, you put something on the sensor, you spray black color on the camera lenses. So it's not really destroying them. You can still repair them, but it's tempering. So it, you cannot use them anymore. And then there is also another place which we're calling the cyber physical attacks, which is pretty much everything which has to do with cyber attacks, which are combined with physical attacks. So it becomes even easier to a cyber attack uh, a device if you're close to it and you can connect to it directly. Uh, by the way, all of these things, uh, like we, my group is focusing on these two. The other one is the work of Matthias Holik, who is colleague of yours here. Uh, we have a general, uh, we, we have a common um, DFG project we just started and we'll be looking into those for the next three years. So it's really work in progress here. But we're looking into those really physical stuff. So what is now self-awareness? So I think I have uh, convinced you by now that we need to do something about it. We cannot simply say we test it in the lab, everything works nicely, and we put uh, a sign, please do not touch somewhere in the forest. That will simply not work out. The spider cannot read. So we need, our idea is really to attack that by, by this general concept of self-awareness, of making the device be aware of what it is, what is its correct behavior, and whether it's normally functioning or something is wrong. It is very, very similar, and it's at the end inspired to our biological self-awareness, right? Like, I know whether my arm is okay or moves somehow weirdly today. So I can call at least for help, right? I can do something about it, and at least I can call for help, and I know that something is wrong. So what is self-awareness? It's a little bit philosophical at this point of time, I know, but at the end it can be 
taken from this general philosophical statement, I think, therefore I am, we can change that a little bit and say, I sense, therefore I am. So if something is happening, it's actually something is going on and it's good for us. If nothing is happening, then it's a problem. So if I just stop thinking, it's a problem. And um, at the end, the self-awareness as a definition is simply the knowledge of your own components, whether it's hands and arms and, 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 and feet, or it's your sensors and battery and processors. It actually doesn't really matter. And how they're doing all of them individually and as a whole. And uh, self-awareness leads automatically to the possibility of self-protection and self-repair, and including those cases where you cannot do anything, but you can call for help, which is already a big step forward of what our IoT devices are currently doing. So what is collective intelligence? I think most of you know these guys. Who doesn't know these guys? Everybody knows these guys. Okay, very nice. I don't have to explain. So it's a collective intelligence, right? So what does it actually mean? First of all, we need to extend this definition. So obviously the self-awareness is still a necessary part also of a collective intelligence. But we need to extend it so that the different devices or the different entities in this collective are know actually each other. They can recognize each other in some way. Very importantly, they can observe each other, like we are observing each other, right? Like we always see how the others are doing. We can help each other, but not to forget, they also are able to blame each other. That sounds maybe a little bit weird, but it's actually a very important part that the, society, the collective, let's call it collective here, is able to recognize that one of its entities is malfunctioning in one way or another. Whether it's intentional or not, it doesn't matter at all. It's important to be able to understand that one of the entities is wrong and something has to be done about it. So let's try now for a more technical definition. Okay, so what is self-awareness? First of all, we said it's a knowledge about the individual components. It is knowledge also about the software structure and goals. So not only about the individual hardware pieces, and I check them all and say, oh, it's good, but I need to bring them also together and to see whether the general goal is actually uh, addressed or not. We need to be able to differentiate between correct and incorrect behavior, or at least an, about suspicious behavior and we are able to identify some common mistakes and problems and repair them. It's a little bit like what you do when you feel weird. Sometimes you know what to do. If you have a headache, you take maybe just a tablet, a painkiller. If you're not feeling well today, you just stay at home and you know it will be okay. But sometimes something happens where you say, I don't know what's happening with me, I need to go to the doctor. Or you call the doctor. It's exactly the same idea which we're trying now to implement also here. With the collective intelligence or collective awareness, it becomes a little bit more shaky. We're not that far. But at the end, let's try. First of all, we need to identify the members of the collective, irrespective of the ownership. I have put there something. This is very, very specific to IoT devices, uh, where everybody is kind of focusing on, OK, I can do a lot of things if all of the devices are under the same system. Either it's the same ownership or it's the same architecture or they are complying to the same communication protocol or whatever else. So there is some, a lot of commonalities between the entities. But it will be much more interesting to see whether they can recognize each other even if it is less commonalities there. So maybe some sort of a communication protocol should be there, maybe not, why not? They have also to be able to extend the collective autonomously. So if a new device comes in, this is, a old, uh, this is actually an old problem in IoT, we need to add new devices autonomously and not by somebody typing in some sort of passwords, IP addresses, or you name it. Then you need to be ab able to observe each other. Observing could be done via camera, actually, via audio, if you know what they're supposed to do, you can try to use also those channels. And of course, communication is a quite of an obvious one. 
And they should be able at least to differentiate between correct and suspicious behavior. It is not about saying, you're wrong, you go out. It's about saying, uh, something is wrong, can, you, can we check all together, please? Or maybe somebody else, what's going on here? Okay, and there should be at least some ability to self-repair. Let me make a small example so that becomes a little bit more clear. Let us imagine you have a camera system on a fence like that, okay? So this is supposed here to be the fence. And you have different cameras which are looking from the, like, remember our wolves and our livestock uh, fences. They are covering the whole area and in a way that they actually overlap a little bit, okay? Uh, this is not really to scale and not really to understand very well the system, it's just a concept. So what happens, for example, if this camera suddenly disappears? <laughs> wow! Uh, that was interesting. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, PowerPoint. Just on time. Amazing. Just amazing. I would say self-awareness, right? I mean, my computer learned already what it is about. Okay, so let's try again. So now imagine the camera only disappears. Thank you very much. Um, so what to do? The problem is really that now you have a problem, right? There is now a channel. There is now part in front of the fence where you could put a sign, wolves this way, please. Right? Because you do not cover everything. So that is a relatively simple example, which is not there, not implemented yet, pretty much, where the cameras, my goodness, where the cameras simply have to turn around. They have to recognize that there is a problem. And because we had quite a lot of overlapping here, we could actually just turn all of them a little bit around, and this one camera gap disappears. And then, of course, we can also call for help, and somebody comes in a couple of days and closes the problem, really. But you can survive that particular night without saying, well, uh, my system didn't work today, sorry. So, um, okay. So let me now present you two case studies, which we already implemented and which are working pretty well. The first one is, I promised you a little bit more information about complex sensor faults. So, first of all, what kind of sensory faulty data you could get? It could be something very simple like a zero fault, okay? You get a zero from your sensor, you know that, nah, something is wrong. That's not possible, that for a couple of hours it gives me simply zeros. It could be a constant value, so the same problem as a zero, but it's a constant value which just, just doesn't change at all throughout time. It could be also something like spikes and outliers. These are also relatively easy to catch and to understand. If you just put a sliding window or something like that, you say, well, okay, if suddenly the temperature is 120 degrees, before it was 25, after that it's 25, it's okay. We understand what's happening. However, sometimes comes something which uh, people are calling subtle faultiness, which is exactly the example which I gave you before. Here is another one, where again we have one reference sensor, the blue one, and one faulty one. And it, 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 is a pro, it is doing something. There is no spikes, there are no zeros, there is not a constant value. It is following some sort of a daily schedule, if you want, because it's all humidity, so it's probably normal. But um, it is actually faulty data. And if you see really the numbers, like let's say here this one, you see that the difference is actually quite dramatic. This is 60% to, to over to 90% almost. So this is a big difference. It's not about a few percent. So um, how can you do some fault recognition? In general, you have pretty much two possibilities. Well, let's say two modern possibilities to do that. You could do some sort of a prediction and then you calculate the difference between the predicted value and what you actually get. So for example, you predict that during the day I expect the temperature to be rising. I have some sort of a model for this particular agricultural field or whatever you have as an environment. You calculate, you predict some value of let's say 25 degrees. You suddenly get something like 80 degrees. You know that nah, something is wrong here. I have to at least say that 
I deliver, I, I sense the value which was not predicted. The other way to do that is some sort of classification, to not say I predict a particular value and I calculate the difference, but I immediately predict whether it's correct or not. This is a little bit more complex and it has to do more with, let's say, a more complex model, more historical value, but also kind of what is a normal increase or decrease of the values and so on and so forth. And this is the way which we are we will try now to recognize, to recognize those faulty sensors. So for that, we first needed to gather data. We figured out that everybody who is uh, presenting or publishing their sensory data, they make sure that the data is correct, which is very nice, but not good for us because we actually need faulty data. So what uh, my PhD student did is she implemented everything, okay, I admit that, uh, that admittedly that looks a little bit funny, typically you should put it in a box and so on, but it doesn't change really that much of the concept. Like, we implemented that, which is a very simple agricultural scenario, let's say, and we have several data sets. They're all full of temperature and humidity data. This is uh, easy to gather, very cheap data, and you can, you can get lots of those data. Uh, and in the first data set, we have one correct sensor, one old sensor, and approximately a week of data. And the second data set was a little bit more interesting. There we had several sensors, and they were all correctly working at the beginning. Then one of them, we exposed it to steam water. This is something we took from the specification sheet, actually, of the sensor, where it says, do not steam the sensor. We took some sensor and steamed it to see what will happen. And it was a very fast damage, like it was amazing, like just over a cup of hot tea and it was over. Uh, and it was permanent damage, so there was nothing to do anymore. You cannot recalibrate, recalibrate those sensors, um, you cannot do anything. The third sensor we got covered by leaves, as you can see in the picture. That was the idea to simulate actually exactly this problem, like leaves covering your sensor, but it could have been also an animal which sits down on your sensor, right? Like it could be anything which is just is in direct contact with the sensor itself. And so if you're interested in data sets, they are all under GitHub, you can get them. So what did we do? First of all, we assume that there is some sort of a correct period. So in the beginning, when you install the sensors, you assume that they're calibrated, everything is working. This is actually not a, let's say, impossible assumption because this is what typically happens, right? That you go install the sensor, you make sure that everything is working nicely, you go home and it breaks. So this first phase where it's working nicely, this is what we now rely on. Then we're trying to, then we will train a model with the correct data. It is an individual training model for each of the nodes. So you, you, you don't have one model for all of them, but you really train it on the spot with the data on the spot. And then we use this model, of course, to classify future samples as correct or faulty. We tried out several different classification methods, support vector machine, random forest decision tree, CNNs. From experience and from tests, we figured out that the support vector machine is a kind of the sweet point for us. It is very efficient, can be run even on a, on a microcontroller, and it gives us actually very, very good results, comparable, for example, to CNNs or to, this, or to random forests. And what we also tried is to see what kind of the data actually, like what, what, what do we need from the data itself in order to train a successful model. We tried first with raw data, like just the data itself. Then we tried also to extract some really good, some features actually from those data. And the interesting part here is that we not only tried to extract features from the sensory data itself, but also from weather stations which are around, which is also a very, uh, let's say, plausible assumption that you will have also additional data around you, which can be used to infer whether your data is correct or not. And so we tried it uh, once only with local features, so only the features of the data gathered by the node itself, and then once with local and global features. And what we have seen, let us see one of the examples here. This is a little bit hard to understand, so I will guide you through it. 
If we look, for example, into one small excerpt of the complete data set and we see the classification, you see the ground truth is in gray. This thing is moving too much. Uh, then the not correctly data, attention, attention, is the green one. Okay, so this is data which has been wrongly classified. False positives or negatives doesn't matter at this time. And then the correctly classified ones are those orange points. So if you look through all the whole story, you see that there are a lot of greenish stuff, which is, of course, not good for us. So using only raw data, this is the support vector machine only with raw data, obviously is not working very well. And every time something starts changing really, it is not able to make this change and to say whether this change is actually okay and predictable and doable or it's something completely out of order. So the accuracy was only 50%. The F1 score, 0 0.6 is not great. Like I'm not going into details. F1 score is what you use for machine learning in general. <laughs> I think most of you know what it is. Um, so let us now compare what happens. This is our data, which I already presented. Now notice again how much green stuff we have. That's bad for us. And then the support vector machine with features, but only local features. So what we see now is, let's see this excerpt here, where we suddenly see that the green ones start disappearing. Right? So this increases, for example, you see it above very nicely that the increase and the decrease was a problem. When it was approximately constant, it was all okay. And so here now that started disappearing. And now the accuracy increased to 86%, which is significantly. And if we now make yet another, like you can look, of course, into the other pieces here, Every time something suddenly changes, it's a problem for the model, pretty much, but it gets now much better. And if you compare this, the, the most local features with global features, you see that it gets even better. Because now, of course, the weather station tells you what is approximately the trend of the temperature and the humidity, and you can easily deduce that, ah, okay, if the weather station is falling down the temperature, it's okay if my temperature also falls down. Right? This is plausible, but also very, very helpful. Even if it is not exactly the same, like you have to be careful here that we're not simply doubling the data, okay? This is not simply using the ground truth or something like that. The weather station can be pretty far away from your agricultural field. And your temperature sensor might be in the ground, the weather station is not. So the differences might still be very, very significant, but the trend is approximately the same, okay? So now the accuracy went up again, but you see also that the difference in the accuracy is not that dramatic anymore. So actually that tells us that even with local features alone, we can run a very robust system. And if we have, in case we have this weather data or such, let's say, um, remote ground truth, then we can get a little bit better even. Okay, so the second one is a little bit more entertaining, let's say. A student of us wanted to try out whether it's possible to recognize in an easy manner whether somebody is trying to steal your device. And he put it over there in a, um, in, in a tree. The idea was, okay, where do you put such devices usually? In a forest, you put them on a tree. And so the idea is really, okay, can we actually recognize them by ourselves with a simple accelerometer, for example, and start a buzzer so it starts an alarm? Uh, he did quite a lot of experiments, and uh, the tree shaking due to wind was kind of our positive case where it's okay, right? It should not issue any alarm if, some, if the wind is simply shaking the tree itself. But then he tried with all possible things which can happen and somebody is trying to steal your device. So for example, removal of device and just throw it out. Or uh, you attempt to remove it, but you don't manage to because it was well secured. Or you quickly pull the device or you remove the device and throw it lightly, or you pick up the device and carry it around, and so forth and so forth. Like, he had really lots of cases here. But the interesting thing was that um, we actually were able to very clearly differentiate between this wind-shaking scenario and everything else. So if you look here into some accelerometer data, 
Um, you see, this is the tree shaking in, let's say, X direction. Doesn't really matter for, for, our, for our discussion. Uh, and this was a quick pulling of the device, for example. So you see it also with naked eyes, pretty much, that there is a significant difference. And here below, we have also walk around with a device in hand, which is actually a very soft scenario, I would say. It's not something which violently shakes the device, but you just walk around with your device slowly around. And so from those, he actually just simply calculated some thresholds. That was our kind of first shoot. Uh, to say, okay, how well it will work if we just use thresholds. <laughs> he calculated the thresholds between the wind shaking scenario and everything else and figured it out for each direction. And he tested it now in new set of experiments, like he put it on another tree and started doing exactly the same experiments again. The only thing which didn't work very well, like it worked sometimes, but not always, this is the 90% accuracy there which, which we're observing, was the case when somebody very slowly and carefully removes the device and starts walking very slowly ago. That didn't work. And uh, when he was testing it, it was obvious that if somebody does it kind of angriness, it works. If somebody does it really well, like somebody tries to to, to cheat on the system, then of course you can cheat on it. So our next idea will be to use maybe some machine learning to see whether we can get better, or the thresholds were actually perfectly fine. So that was a lot of pictures and data and case studies and so on. So now what is actually our plan for the future? First of all, one of the questions is, of course, can we somehow generalize this whole story? Because we are now working case by case, which is very interesting. And of course, you can implement them also case by case. But at some point, your poor microcontroller will have to carry 20 different ML models. This is not really what should be happening here. Um, and so one of our next research questions is really, can we generalize this and somehow make it more abstract, if you want, not sensor by sensor. Then, of course, um, right now, we are only focusing at the end on those problems which we know about. We have a data set of the problem, we know the problem, we have a data set, we train a model, we recognize the problem. Fine, but what to do with all of these cases where we just don't think about it? Can we also somehow include those? That will be a very interesting question. And of course, how to prevent actual user errors. Because typically, like I love this, this, this comic, you know, like you say in this corner, we have firewalls and encryption and antivirus and machine learning models. And on the other corner, we have Dave. So it's really a good question. And we observe it all over the time that whatever you do, you give it to an end user, even a very well experienced and well trained user, and they just break your system. Um, and so this is also part of this problem, right? It's not exactly self-awareness, it's not exactly protection, but at the end some sort of a better design, better user interface, so that the users use these devices correctly, and they cannot break them by default, even if they try. So if you would like to have some fun actually about user Inner faces. This is a very nice website which I can uh, propose to you for Friday evening or Saturday somewhere when you're bored. It's a very beautiful way of seeing how bad the user interface can be. Um, and of course, all of our connections here if you would like to know more about our projects and our working group. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, we'll start here. Yeah, th thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Um, I have two, but let's start with one and then see if there's time for the other. Um, the first one I was wondering about is could you just sort of, instead of training, calibrating everything and you train it in a sort of known nice environment without errors and so on, 
um, well, you do that, but then in the wild, like, who knows, right? So now you deploy, like, lots of those, and maybe the sensor is already faulty. But in the end, who cares, right? So it's something where who cares if the temperature tells you temperature or just, um, like, random, random numbers as long as you figure out that those numbers mean something. A machine learning model learns to interpret those, right? So could you just deploy them? and then do sort of continuous learning or transfer learning to understand compared to your originally sort of learned nice machine learning models. Now you have this deployment, you continue training a little bit and figure out, it figures out that, well, these sensors are faulty, they give you wrong data, but they give you something that helps with the inference. And of course, you'd have to continue doing that as the network degrades over time, and maybe at some point it's just unusable. But for a long time, it just sort of learns to deal with what it's got hmm. rather than figuring out this sensor is faulty, don't listen to it. That's a very nice thought. Thank you. Um, I, I must admit that we have not thought about that, but it's a very interesting idea, actually, a very nice way of looking into the problem. And, uh, um, the, the, you know, like somehow we assume that also, that you're not simply throwing them away, but you see what you can do with them. Right, but the first step will be to recognize that actually something is slightly wrong, and then to see whether uh, you should do something about it and what it is exactly. But to adapt to the faultiness is a nice idea. Um, I will take it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you talked about the uh, uh, collective awareness and um, recognizing the unknown. I was wondering um, that there's a high risk that you would, in, in um, mutual observation, you would observe a wrong information, basically, uh, and, and thereby especially not detect the unknown. Have you thought about uh, trust as, mm. as one way to cope with this? You, you know, um, yeah. human-like. Mm -hmm. models, not, not the trusty computing kind of, of things. Yeah, I, I think that goes a little bit also into the direction of the first question, right? Like uh, this faultiness, um, we tend to assume it's a kind of a binary decision and we, I presented it like that, I admit, right? Like I presented it as a binary decision, it's faulty or correct. At the end, the reality is not that simple. That's why when I was defining the self-awareness or the collective awareness, I was not talking about correct and faulty de de behavior, but about correct and suspicious behavior. And this for me is a very, very important part here to say, okay, something is suspicious, but not necessarily incorrect. And we have to see what we can do with that. And at the same time, we have to see what the others are saying and whether we can reach some sort of a conclusion or decision what to do. Mm -hmm. Trust is one interesting concept that I have to push a little bit to Matthias Holik. <laughs> That's his part of the project. Um, but yes, we're thinking also exactly about these trust things because one node could be also potentially even infected. Right, like there is a possibility that it will be intentionally delivering wrong information about its neighbors. All of these things need to be considered, yes. Uh, honestly, I think we're just starting with this topic and I have something to do until I retire, pretty much. <laughs> there are a couple of years more to go. They forgot you. Um, so, so thanks a lot for the talk. It's actually very interesting to see what happens when you take things in the wild. Um, regarding the first uh, problem, which was detection of the faults, um, there is a problem with the cameras, which I think maybe some sort of high-end image processing would tell you where that's a spider and or there's a spider verb on covering things. So that's not so easy. But um, in terms of temperature, humidity, isn't it, uh, I mean, I don't know what is the deployment density, but isn't it easier to just look into, I mean, the temperature should not vary too much in your environment, right? So the humidity, there is a tolerance, right? Uh, isn't it easier to just look what's happening in other areas of the network and you somehow figure out the outlier and that could be pointing to a faulty sensor? 
it's, it, it's a difficult trade-off. Uh, especially in the agricultural scenario, we work a lot with developing countries. We work with uh, Sri Lanka especially and Cameroon. And there, one device more is a no-go. People can afford one device for their whole farm. And uh, that becomes a problem to say, okay, we just spread a little bit more sensors and then we can do cool stuff like what you're proposing. Sometimes it's a matter of the environment itself, that uh, the environment itself is so diverse, even in the same farm, let's say, or in the same forest, that you cannot actually use any inference and any, um, anything from the other sensors. There is no way. So it's a kind of a trade-off. On one side, yes, you could do it, and this is exactly this comes into this collective awareness, right? That if I recognize that one of the sensors is completely kind of incorrect, I should not trust it at all anymore, then I, of course, as a, as a, as a kind of intermediate decision or intermediate step, I could use the data of the others to see what's happening. Right, exactly as the cameras were turning around and using simply less overlapping so that they can do the job. But it's a difficult trade-off, and you cannot simply assume that it's always the case. That you can always have more sensors than you need, and you can simply use redundancy. It doesn't work always. <laughs> but we do it in other scenarios, sorry. We do it in other scenarios, like space and space habitats. We go only for redundancy. Because there, uh, like correctness and redundancy, because there you need somehow the 100% reliability. Sorry, yes, now thanks. it's your no, turn. No, I have a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, the fascinating talks. I, I was just wondering, I mean, in the end, the application of the wolf scenario, mm. the, the wolf repellent, uh, the cameras could run in isolation, just independent mm -hmm. of each other, and by what you're doing, there's a need for um, communication, which mm -hmm. increases overhead. How does that... I mean, how does that go into your power budget of, of your, your sensors? I mean, That's uh, what all farmers ask, uh, keep asking me. Um, it um, is... Uh, okay, so our particular scenario with the wolves, the idea is that each camera is self-sustaining, let's say, and it does the inference, the model inference on the spot without sending the pictures to the cloud. This is done mostly for data privacy reasons that we are not allowed simply to gather images and to send them somewhere for further processing. So we have to do it on the spot and throw them away immediately. However, we have some minimal communication. Tip right now we're playing with LoRa, but it's not necessarily the end decision, that they talk to each other and they talk to the cloud, of course, to, see, to, to, to deliver the results pretty much. And the energy budget is not that much, like by a LoRa transceiver, the energy budget doesn't matter at all. Like the camera needs much more power. Uh, and it needs very reliable power. So the LoRa transceiver, the communication is not yeah, an I mean, issue. I'm, I'm, that's, that's, that's fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the overall, the, the kind of you're sending things up to the cloud, then... Uh, yeah, but we only send results. We yeah, only so says, so uh, all say all wolf, no wolf. Okay. That's it, because we're not allowed to send, to send more. And That's the point. And you're doing that on a microcontroller? We're doing it right now on a Raspberry Pi. Good. Uh, the microcontroller is sitting next to it uh, and helps out with other things, like, uh, uh, some s like, control, like actually observing the Raspberry Pi, whether it's correctly running. And also, uh, what do we else do with that? Um, some other helping functions at the end. Thank but we much. have both. Yeah. Like it's it, it it's a pretty big box actually. <laughs> With almost most of it battery. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Thank you very much. Um so for the first scenario, uh, why don't you try to replace the cameras with with different devices like LiDAR, for instance? We're trying it right now actually. The ah, problem yeah. is that we cannot recognize the wall from the dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is a problem because mm -hmm. uh, we're in the wild, but there are many people around. Hikers, uh, people with dogs, and we have to be able to, rec to differentiate well between a dog and a wolf. And this is possible with a normal camera because then you see the fur and this and that, but the dog it looks a little bit, hopefully, like most of them look a little bit differently. 
If we only use a LiDAR, we have a problem with dogs, we have a problem also with wild pigs. They mm. look almost the same in the litter. <laughs> okay. And uh, this is not optimal, but we are considering a combination. Because the camera, sometimes we have a problem then with rain and spiders, and maybe if we combine both, we will have a little bit of a better uh, reliability. And they, they don't have to necessarily run in parallel the whole time, like we can switch between them. If we see, for example, the camera, he has a spider net in front of the lenses, or somebody turned it around, I can still use maybe the lighter. But mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Oh, good. And they got cheaper, so now we can experiment with them, yeah. yeah. When we started, they were very expensive, and, and we, we didn't consider it. More like, uh, like the, the power consumption is getting yeah. also lower. Yeah. Well, good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, to uh, not run completely out of schedule, maybe we can use the coffee break or the lunch break to uh, ask more questions. I'm happy to answer more questions about wolves. And so uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is already here. And